this is a typical bit of uh, the southwest part of southwest uh, Vice County 59. Lots of flat land, mainly arable, but there, is, there are places for various wild plants to uh, <laughs> take hold. And of course, they're mainly the typical weeds of arable fields. And this is one of my favourite titled books of all time, Arable Plants, A Field Guide. Because <laughs> obviously, that's where you find the arable, <laughs> the arable plants. Now, our native, annuals must have been, <laughs> our native annuals must always have been pretty scarce. And they relied on the long life of the seeds to survive periods when the habitat was not suitable due to succession of uh, other vegetation. Because uh, initially, following glaciation, once the ice cap receded, there was lots of lovely bare ground, and a lot of the pioneer plants would have been these annuals, which uh, germinated quickly, grew quickly, had masses of seeds, which then dropped and formed seed banks. So right in the early days, the annual plants that got here early would have been forming seed banks under uh, subsequent uh, vegetation development. And the, uh, the rural plants in these seed banks would rely on natural ephemeral habitats. Uh, there'd be landslips where trees wind blew, uh, blew over in woodlands, uh, coastal shingles, open grasslands, uh, areas of ground disturbed by animals, erosion of riverbanks. So there'd be scattered little patches, but they'd grow and seed and uh, add to the seed bank again. But when settlers, human settlers came along, especially around seven and a half thousand years ago, when settlers uh, settled and brought agriculture with them, um, their options increased greatly. Not only was the ploughing done to, to sow the crop seeds, but the settlers from further south and further east brought crop seeds and with them weed seeds. So added to the native uh, annual plants which had made here over the land bridge before it uh, disappeared, there's all these exotic species that came in thousands of years ago. And these are what are called archaeophytes. And they're very interesting a part of our uh, flora because they've got cultural and historical significance as well as the botanical significance, of course. But uh, Phil Wilson and Miles King tell this story much better than me. So I recommend you go to that book. In the meantime, is that a bit of a, a local uh, view on things? There's a, ah, can you see that map underneath the uh, yes group of people? Um, this is from the book. We are round about here, so we're, we're sort of slap bang in the middle of the least <laughs> rich area for arable fields. Um, there's generally less than 20 species per hectare. But that doesn't mean, say, we've got less than general uh, 20 species throughout the area because we've got lots of hectares. But, but the, the more thinly distributed, you don't know, get such rich assemblages. To, to get anything a bit rich, you have to go directly east and you've got the Lincolnshire at the start of Yorkshire Worlds. Oh, I can hear myself coming back with, <laughs> coming back a bit later. Um, but you can see the really rich areas are many of the chalks, downlands, and all these uh, rich areas down in the south and the east, the, the Anglian Plains and the Fens are richer than us as well. You've got the Chilterns and the Cotswolds and the Mendips, and then you've got the, the specialised granites and um, serpentines and, and stuff like that down in the southeast but we are where we are so it's interesting to see what we've got and we've had various trips um, and this talk follows on from the September visit we had this year uh, which 
had the, <laughs> we were very unlucky. It was the least rich assemblage that I've seen for years because it's just very variable. Um, in August uh, 2019, the previous trip, we saw a lot more, but we were only there for a third of the time because there's absolute damper and we had to retire like drowned rats. And then we'd had other visits on um, when we went to Haskane Cutting, we went through lots of arable fields then and saw a good range of stuff on June, June 19th, uh, 2016. And again, June 15, we, we went through the, the fields around Orton. So in the area we are, we have found a lot more than 20 species, but not all in the same hectare, of course. Here's a typical patch. Mainly uh, Lamium habidum, they cut leaf dead nettle. You've got knockgrass, mayweeds, speedwell. There's about half a dozen species in there. And that and that's pretty typical. It just wasn't like this when we went in uh, September this year and there's some shepherd's purse coming through there. And this is what you expect. This is early in the season when things are still small and just starting. But the interesting thing about these um, agriculture and uh, the native and the archaeophyte plants is it a lot of them were included in a diet and there have been bog people discovered in bogs ranging from far over in Siberia all through Russia, Northern Europe, into Britain and into Ireland. And these peat bog bodies, many of which seem to have got there in some sort of ritual and been deliberately put there, are extremely well preserved. And of course, the contents of their gut were preserved as well. So people could work out what their last meal had been. And generally it's some sort of porridge. And this is one of the recipes. And it's obviously post the um, introduction of agriculture because you've got barley and wheat. And flax is another one that's introduced. Oh, hang on. These are often imported, the, the crop seeds. A lot of them are wild and are native to this country. And a lot of them are these archaeophytes, plants which have been here for many thousands of years, but didn't originate here. So we've got quite a mix in this um, early form of porridge, as well as the, the, the main grains. Lots of things we recognise today. Fat hen, we see around here, corn, spurry, black bindweed, violet seeds. These are most likely to be um, field pansy, viola arvensa, arvensis, galeopsis seeds, various mustard seeds, dock seeds, gristle grass, ceteria, chamomile. A good mix of natives and uh, archaeophytes in with the main crop species. And you wonder, presumably these are mainly deliberate additions rather than um, contamination of the mix. But you do wonder when you can have half a teaspoon of fine sand, mm. <laughs> presumably that is a contamination. But it also makes you realise that before agriculture, the hunter-gatherers didn't just hunt they gathered so they'd have nuts, berries, seeds, leaves and a lot of these plants like the fat hen and the, um, the red shank they would have been used then but they would have been much more sparsely uh, distributed than they are you know, once agriculture came. This is a rough timeline again from the uh, arable weeds book there's already cereal cultivation in the, in the, the Middle East uh, 14,000 years ago. But the uh, 
our glaciation didn't end until around 10,000 years ago. And it's after that that plants started moving in. And then once we, the, the first evidence of settled arable agriculture is until seven and a half thousand years ago. So there's been a heck of a long time for these archaeophytes to have been brought in and then spread around all the um, arable uh, areas uh, uh, of the uh, British Isles. When Bronze Age is when the Celts came and they brought, the Celts originated in Northern India many millennia earlier. And of course the crop seeds they brought would have, they'd have brought the Asiatic element in. Uh, the Iron Age, oh no, sorry, the Celts were the Iron Age, not the Bronze Age. And then the Romans, they brought improved versions of crops in to various wheats, including spelt and, and, and barley uh, brought in. And then by the eighth century AD, most of the country, the Roman field system had fallen apart and the Anglo-Saxon open field system was set up over most of the uh, settled parts of the country. And then you start finding weeds coming into law with corn marigold being a noted pest as early as the 12th century. But by the time you get to the mid 19th century, the heyday, of the, um, the arable weeds is starting to wane a bit because you've got improvements in agriculture, sea cleaning, use of uh, pesticides and all sorts. So now what we've got is what can just survive along the edges of the fields, which aren't, aren't so intensively managed as the, the main crop areas often next to nothing at all growing in with the uh, the crop plants itself. <coughs> but here's uh, a, 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 another typical bit of field edge locally and a lot of these are things that are in the, the porridge recipe. This is the red shank, the persicaria, there's fat hen, there's the black bindweed, various grasses, there's a uh, crucifer there of some sort, a bit of groundsel. And this is what a lot of our field edges look like. It's just a shame they didn't look like it when we did our last uh, field meeting. This is one of the important species, which must have been a food plant ever since humans arrived here. This is the, the red shank. Uh, Persicaria, Persicaria maculata, and this is actually native. So this did make its its own way across the uh, the land bridge from continental Europe post glaciation. And when it's growing in lush, in uh, fertile soil, it produces tall, lush plants, and the flowers are then start set seed. And you can see these flowers are quite heavy with seed. And you had a patch like this near your, your camp or your settlement or you found it when you were wandering around as a nomad, you'd soon get a good few handfuls of seed from these big, fat, heavy uh, seed heads. And then later in the year, when the seeds are mainly dropped, you can see why it's called red shank. You get these bright red stems and that's quite a feature around the edges of the fields and a lot of the arable weeds they tend to grow upwards once the seeds start forming they get taller and taller and taller and I presume that's to help distribute the seeds over a wider and a wider area. Now this is a relative quite a close relative of the uh, red shank. This is uh, buckwheat um, it's not something I've seen locally, but when I've been doing surveys over in Yorkshire and areas further south, you do find buckwheat persevering as a field wood, and it's this, this the white flowered thing. Very different in leaf to the red shank. There's a red shank here, the long narrow leaves. 
and uh, this of course is still grown as commercial crop and it's a, a, a vital ingredient of um, traditional French crepe, especially the Breton crepe, they have buckwheat in them and it's something we might get to see more and more, it might spread into our area. You can see fat hen going up through it as well in the background. This is another one of our native wonder plants. This is um, fat hen, Kenipodium album. And this is a, a very useful plant. It's related to spinach, very nourishing leaves, full of vitamins, very good for you. And here you can see it flowering. And after it's flowered, Again, it sets these chunky heads of seeds. So if you've got a good patch of fat hen, you can collect plenty of seeds off it in a, quite a short time. So if you're wandering around all day looking for food, you know, if it's the right time of year, um, you'd find lots of nourishment in the, uh, the fat hen seeds. And of course, this is one of the components of the, uh, the peat and bog person porridge as well. Now, here's another Kenopodium. Does anybody recognize this? It's um, Kenopodium quinoa, which is grown for its seed quinoa. It's a South American plant. It's, it is hardy here and it is grown, starting to be grown here. And I expect it will start to join our uh, arable weed flora but uh, I don't think it's been recorded much yet. But when it is recorded, it will be a neophyte as opposed to an archaeophyte, a plant that's got here recently in sort of new times. And here's a, another relative of the um, buckwheat, is the black bindweed. Um, Fallopia, or is it Renutria now? Um, convolvulus. And this is a twining plant. A lot of the other arable weeds I mentioned that start to grow very tall. Set. But this one simply climbs up the crop <laughs> to get its uh, the ripe seeds into a, a better position for dispersal. And this is what this looks like when it sets seed. The flower head expands quite greatly and it has these sort of angled seeds, very much like buckwheat seeds, in fact. Though it's not as safe to eat as, as buckwheat itself. Now, as I mentioned, the, uh, the original array of uh, native ruderals and archaeophytes <laughs> from uh, human ac activities. So as well as the Im improved seed cleaning techniques and the use of weed killers, mechanization has helped a lot. The plowing and harrowing and everything has been much more efficient. Uh, crop rotation has changed. Silage has come in rather than uh, hay meadow, so plants haven't seeded. There's been a lot more drainage, which has reduced the range of uh, habitats for plants to occupy and hedgerows have been cleared, which has uh, reduced shelter and all sorts. Um, but despite that, <coughs> seed bank still persists. So this is Scarf Hill water tower on the uh, east side of Ormsgate, going towards Scammersdale. And it's a big arable area and the fields are usually, you know, generally bereft of any vegetation. Uh, other than the crop, except on the very edges. But this is in uh, uh, 2019. They cleared a big strip to put a pipeline in and, and tipped all the tops along the edge. And in no time at all, the bare soil was covered in annual plants from the seed bank. In fact, driving along Scarf Hill Lane, it was almost like uh, the hedges had started flowing again, you're back to May Blossom. But in fact, it's mainly Mayflower. And there's quite a range of stuff in here. There was um, odd patches of corn marigold, which I haven't actually included in this picture, but we'll see that later. But mainly Mayflower, 
Kennepodium. Uh, uh, I'll list some other things later. But one thing that I thought was notable from its absence is the poppy. We've, even when I was very small and we saw poppies in fields, there'd only be a tiny sprinkling in the edges and there were only ever uh, Papava dubium. They weren't the, the big bright red corn poppy. And I found it particularly odd that there wasn't any poppy in this seed bank or appeared not to be any poppy in this seed bank. Because if you go along here, the next lane to the right is Poppy Lane. Uh, it must have been called out for a reason. But anyway, non visible there. There's lots of scentless mayweed, which is native. You can see the fat hen there. But below the, the big mayweed bushes, there's masses and masses of corn spurry. And it's one of those which germinates early, flowers early, and then seeds early. So look at all those capsules. It's like like a miniature um, red campion, really. It's in the same family, the, uh, the, the pink family. And each one of those little capsules is full of seeds, and they've all been scattered back into the, uh, the soil. So when that's all pushed back and they, it's, the field is farmed again, all this seed bank is renewed and will be there for the next time it's disturbed. And uh, things can last an awful long time. Um, uh, it's known that field bindweed can grow after 50 years of burial, but there's cases in a, a deposit of uh, mustard seed was a 600 year old deposit of mustard seed was found in death. But that grew when it was uh, planted in topsoil and watered. So they can have you know, potentially centuries of, of, of life as a seed bank, just waiting for the next, next bit of disturbance. This is what the corn swirry looks like earlier on. It's got typical five petal flower, the pink family, and these long narrow leaves, it's almost Carnation-like, you could say, <laughs> but this is corn spurry. And again, this is uh, another constituent of that uh, primeval porridge. Another native, which is very productive to hunter-gatherers, is the uh, greater plantain, Plantago major. Um, that is a very robust plant. Any, any paths worn through uh, vegetation or along the edge of a field, this will stand being trodden on and growing quite happily. Here's a, a less trodden version. The leaves are edible too, though a bit stringy as you might imagine. But it sends up these spikes of flowers which elongate into long spikes full of seeds. And we used to go around collecting these as kids. And there's a couple of old guys on the estate who used to take them to, to them. Uh, no payment, we just the way of getting to see the budgies and <laughs> enjoying uh, uh, that experience. But they're everywhere. And this is along the path uh, ladies walk. Uh, the other side of Ormsgate. And you can just see how much seed there is there. And again, this is something which was very gatherable for the, for the, for the hunter gatherers. Again, another patch. At different times of year and different years, the same field edge can look quite different, which seeds have been brought closest to the surface. And again, this is a, a typical mix. You've got fumitry, there's a couple of species of fumitry occur locally. Um, that's their archaeophytes. Fumitry grows very fast. It's a member of the poppy family. It has these greyish leaves, which are supposed to look like smoke. And this, these smoky leaves rising up out of the, uh, the ground uh, gave it the name in French of fume de terre apparently, smoke of the earth, and that's where we get the word fumitory from. But there's also <coughs> neophytes in the, uh, the field 
uh, speed rail there. Um, so we've got a mix of uh, this, uh, what do we call it, fat hen. We've got a mix of natives and neophytes and archaeophytes, ground soil as well. And that's typical as uh, annual meadow grass, quite a few things. Is the uh, common ramping geometry. Um, again, it's, that's a, a neophyte. But we've also got an endemic geometry, the purple ramping geometry, uh, which is uh, nationally scarce. And we, uh, this picture was taken on the, the trip we did on the 10th of August uh, 2019. And it was more or less dry up to that point. But then uh, we got as far as the patch of Ansinkia, which is I know one patch locally, Ansinkia, like a Bisoides, the fiddle neck. And the heavens just opened and we just had to abandon it. But I managed to grab a bit, bring home for definite identification. And it, it, it is the purple ramping geometry. And although we're in a an area of low diversity of arable weeds, as we saw from that map. We are in a bit of a hot spot, really, for purple ramping fumitry, which is a, a nationally scarce plant. So it likes the west coast and the marshes, the east coast of Ireland, and the sort of central belt of Scotland. And then it, all these areas that have 50 plus species haven't got purple ramping fumitry. So one up for us. And this is typical of it. Once the flowers have opened, they tend to bend, the stem bends down and they, they hang vertically. They have these big serrated sepals. Oh, didn't mean to do that. <laughs> and the, uh, the seed, uh, uh, the pedicel and the seed pod is distinctive as well. Here's one of the neophytes. Uh, this came from the um, Middle East and it wasn't noticed as a field, field weed until 1826. That was when it first started to be recorded. And it, its name gives you a clue as a, to its origins. It's um, Veronica Persica. So it's from Iran and that's the basin, really, that's really where um, agriculture began. So it's a wonder that it isn't an archetype, but no, it's. Uh, it came in much later. But once it's here, it spreads very well, it grows quickly, and once it sets seed, it has these very distinctive two lobe seed capsules full of seeds, and they just get scattered everywhere. It's, it's one of the dependable seed weeds, field weeds, that we, we can have. Another quite dependable one locally is this one. This is a typical bit of fairly freshly turned ground. So the seed weeds have been brought up. You've got the fat hen again. You've got a, 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 a brassica crucifer, which is probably going to be Cisimbrium um, officinale, the hedge mustard, there it is again. But most of this, these little tiny jaggedy edge things, are, are, they, are, are the uh, archaeophyte plant uh, annual nettle. Mm. It's a very rapid thing. I uh, go back a couple of weeks later and it looks more like that. And it's a generally smaller plant than the stinging nettle. It's got rounder leaves and deeper serrations. And I think the sting is more powerful as well. I don't know if anybody else has experienced that, but I avoid this much more than I do the stinging nettle. As there's urtica urens, another difference from the um, stinging nettle, urtica dioca, is that it's uh, monoecious. It has the male and female flowers on the same plant, unlike stinging nettle, which is dioecious and has separate uh, plants. And then like Many of the other species. Gets the stalks really sprout upwards and it goes from a sort of uh, mid shin height sort of plant 
to uh, knee high and taller, along with a lot of the other things. There's a, a plant of uh, black nightshade, night, black nightshade doing the same thing with its berries there, just to get the, the seeds up and into the air currents and more likely to be distributed further. But from the nettles that sting, we also have dead nettles. And we've got three species from common, reasonably common to fairly uncommon. And these are the two commoner ones. The commonest around our area is the cutly dead nettle. We also get the red dead nettle and they're all archaeophytes. So they came in um, with uh, after the, the, the uh, uh, agriculture. The red dead nettle, Lamium purpureum, has these distinctive, mainly has these distinctive purple colored leaves on the top of the shoot. You can see a flower bud just coming out there. And it's got quite downy leaves and the quite neat edges, so quite crenate, sort of, not totally uniformly, but uh, quite even sized little lobes all around the edges. And that's the, the middling one. You get that, but it's not as common as the cut leaf dead nettle. And the cut leaf dead nettle tends to lack the purple top, has much rougher edge leaves and much more pointed as well and is more frequent and uh, I think a lot of people don't realize that they're two species if they're not sort of uh, looking into their botany particularly. And the third one which is one of my favorites uh, is uh, the hen bit dead nettle. This here it is a very young stage again nice crenate edge and the leaves have got much as you go at the stem, the, ped the um, pedicels get shorter and shorter, so you get almost like a roof forming around the top, but they're quite long stemmed at the base of the plant. If it's a bit later, you can see the flowers starting, flower buds appearing in whorls around. And get some idea of the size of it from comparing it to the, um, the leaves of the red shank on this side. Then that has the same sort of flower, but the corolla tube is quite long. They tend to stick up out of the plant like little uh, periscopes rather than sort of go out sideways like the other two do. And again, that can have the purple in stressed uh, conditions like this has. It's just a closer view of it because it is one of my favorites. And like a lot of these, uh, Labiates has a lovely hairy flowers, hairy all over. Now, an another member of the same family we get locally is the um, Stachys arvensis, yet another archaeophyte. It's a tiny thing, it's uh, much smaller than the hedge woundwort and the marsh woundwort and the hybrid that we're more familiar with. And it likes the sandier areas of our soil. And uh, when we did the walk in September this year, there were some tiny plants of this growing in some of the front gardens we passed uh, in Orton on land that had been farmland up until the, the 1970s. Yeah, so you can see it's got the typical uh, square stems of that family, the opposite leaves and the little hooded lipped flowers. We've also got native um, uh, labiates. Uh, this tetra hit the common hemp nettle. This is included in the porridge, but there was a warning that it, uh, it wasn't very good for you. But this is quite frequent on the field edges as well. Again, got the typical flowers, very hairy, like most of them. And it comes in both pink, uh, purpley pink and white. So we get uh, both forms. Then the other one we get is another archaeophyte. Oh no, they're, they're native, the uh, 
tetrahed. But the, the mm. big, large flowered M nettle is an archaeophyte. And we, that often occurs on PT soil. Since an awful lot of the farmland uh, in our area is derived from drained and ploughed uh, peat bogs, you know, we've got a lot of peaty soil, so it's uh, it, this can be fairly frequent. And it's the most amazingly gaudy thing when you look at it closely. The lower lip has this huge purple blotch, and then purple and yellow speckled into the throat, and again, hairy all over. And it's quite a, lo a large plant as well, it's quite very noticeable. But we do have the odd native member of this family as well. You get corn mint. Again, a bit like the stachys, it's got little whirls of flowers, the opposite leaves and a square stem, but this has a distinctive minty uh, scent. As I say, it's native and unusually, unusual for an arable weed, it's perennial. But I think it's a fairly short-lived perennial, it does seed very uh, readily. And of course, we've got lots of uh, crucifers as well. Uh, I'm not going to mention them all, but this is particularly common uh, around uh, the Ormskirk fields, the fields around Ormskirk. This is the wild radish. Again, an archaephyte, uh, Raphanus raffinistrum, but it's very, very widespread. Um, spiny leaves and these typical or mostly they are pale yellow but you do get other forms as well you get white ones you can see how rough the stems and leaves are which presumably stops it being eaten by uh, every herbivore that passes but i say most of them are this pale yellow and you can see they like to they, they get going quite early so they this barley crop is nowhere near ripe yet, but these seeds will be forming and spreading before that crop is ready to be uh, harvested. Go back into the seed bank and come up in, uh, around the edges, the less weak killed edges, in the in the next year, hopefully. That's just showing you the typical four petaled flowers of the yellow form. But we also get the pink ones as well. And you can see some of the seed pods here. The big fleshy pods with slight wasting between each individual big spherical seed. And uh, the pods will split, and the seeds drop, and again, the cycle goes on. And there's another little crucifer in there. That's the, the hedge mustard. It's the Zimbrium. There's wild oats, and there's fat hen. Again, that, that's typical of a, a local field edge. This is another one of the archaeophytes, another uh, crucifer, little white flowers, four petaled. And at first glance, it, it looks just like the flowers of um, Shepherd's Purse, but they're slightly denser. And then once the seeds started forming, start forming, you see it's not shepherd's purse at all. This is uh, field pennycress, Philaspi arvensi. So little flowers develop into these huge seed pods. And the seed pods have these gigantic wings and this very distinctive notch. And then the seeds are all in this part. And then when they get ripe, this suture, they split along this line here and the seeds come out. And the seeds haven't got any wings at all. And you'd think wings would be for wind dispersal, wouldn't you? But um, I've got a theory which I thought of last night, <laughs> but I haven't looked up yet. You can see it better here. As they ripen, the seeds go from green to yellow and then gold and look even more like little coriums. But they all stand up proud on these stems. And I wonder if they're there to catch the wind and the wind rock, a bit like yellow rattle, will split the, um, 
the sea the, the seed pods open and and uh, some of the seeds get caught up in the wind and distributed that way. But that's my theory anyway. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. It's a nice plan and there's more of that now. I never used to see it in my early days, but uh, you see it most years now. This is something that has always been a lot of. This is the, um, the hedge of mustard, of course. Cymbrium officially. When I was young, and I started looking at plants sort of 9, 10, 11, I could never find what, out what this plant was because none of the books showed just how extremely adpressed these uh, pods are in total contrast to the uh, Thalaspi, which has huge, great uh, pods on long stalks sticking out into the breeze. These are really tightly up to the stem. And I think in its original habitat, this is one of the tumbleweeds. The plant would grow with long stems and the stems would all sort of dry out, grow together, and the, eventually the root would break at the root and they'd be blown across the uh, landscape, tumbling seeds as it went. But it, it doesn't get much chance to do that uh, on the rich arable land of... Um, Holmskirk. But these crucifers uh, would must have been the original food, some of, some of the original food plants of the so-called cabbage whites. This is a small white laying eggs, eggs on hedge mustard. And of course, uh, once we brought cabbages and other brassicas and nasturtiums into our fields and gardens, um, the white population must have increased dramatically. Another family, the mayweeds, the daisy family. This is the scentless mayweed. This is our native one, Triplorosperm inodorum. Again, typical daisy flowers with the ray flowers, ray flowers, and the disc flowers. It's, it seems shepherds growing in amongst it with a head of white flowers. There, it's got these triangular seed pods rather than the big round ones of the penny crest. Locally, the scentless mayweed is getting to be outnumbered by the scented mayweed, um, which is a, not, not a, tr a triplura sperm, but a matricaria, matricaria chamomilla, which is an archaeophyte. And this is the, the one that has the, the hollow receptacle under the disc flowers, whereas the scented mayweed is a much more solid receptacle. And uh, once, once the, uh, the disc florets are fertilized and the seeds begin to form, the seeds obviously swell and the whole central part rises like a mini souffle. And the whole grows to allow this uh, upward expansion. See, it's still flowering there, but here all the seeds are setting. So eventually you end up, there's a little drum on top of the heads and it, it's a lovely thing to, to look closely at these common weeds and, and see fascinating aspects like that. Another one in the same family. This is the uh, pineapple weed. This is a neophyte. This uh, didn't come into this country until the 18th century. Uh, it's from uh, East Asia, so that must have come in with the Now it's here, it's everywhere. It doesn't have any ray florets, it just has the, uh, the disc florets. And it's called a pineapple weed because if you crush the leaf and their flower buds, they really do smell awfully like pineapple. Why that should be, <laughs> I'm not quite sure, but perhaps it's to stop the, the, the leaf being eaten. Perhaps the, uh, the strong scent puts herbivores off. But I'd say it spreads everywhere and each plant has many heads. Each head has many seeds eventually. And then the seeds will fall off and they're sticky. So they get attached to 
like passing animals' feet or walkers' boots. So they spread very well. Thank you. And now we're out of the country. But quite a nice, lovely thing to look at closely. A newer arrival from the same family is the, um, what's it called, Galinsoga. Uh, these have come from South America. Now, there's two species are naturalized here, but the one we mainly see is the shaggy soldier, Galinsoga quadriradiata. And this does have ray florets, but uh, only about five. <laughs> Uh, and a small clump of uh, disc florets. But again, that spreads very rapidly. And we saw on the September walk, the, the planters outside Ormsgate bus station were just a mass of this shaggy soldier. And it looks like they were the plants that were planted rather than the, uh, the busy lizzies and pelagoniums that they're totally overtaken. Uh, it's growing amongst here, uh, another native, and this is another food plant, more on the salad side of things, uh, chickweed, Stellaria uh, uh, media. Uh, and that, that's a, a nice, luscious, sort of lettucey type leaf to eat. Now, this is something, again, in the daisy family that I used to come across very rarely. And it's always a pleasure to see. Uh, corn marigold. There used to be some near Amir Sands Wood and the, the fields around there. And I've seen it uh, um, on High Town Little Crosby area as well. And it is a lovely thing. It, it's a, an archivite brought in to our area a long time ago. It's got these sort of greyish leaves and these big bright yellow flowers. But it, it is a, a contaminant of, uh, of crops and um, is not was not appreciated from very early times. As I say, it used to be you know a red letter day to come across um, corn marigold, but uh, since the popularity of um, seed mixes and uh, cornfield annuals being sown, it's less of a rarity. Admittedly, <laughs> this is a place where it's grown for its seed. This is just outside um, Lunt uh, in Sefton. I think this is um, a land life uh, field, and, and these will be harvested for the seed. But that's one of the main ways now that we see a wide range of arable rudrals is not only in arable fields, it's in areas where they've been sown. So this, for example, is at um, Edge Hill University. When they first developed uh, the area around the sports field, they put one of these cornfield annual mixes in, but with perennials in as well. So you've got oxide daisy scattered all through it, and that will persist. And you've got stuff like um, false grass coming in, plantain. They will eventually become more dominant in vegetation, but you get this first flush of these uh, colourful weeds. So you've got the corn marigold, you've got cornflower, which I've never seen as an actual uh, arable weed uh, getting there under its own devices. I've only ever seen it in seed mixes. And again, corn chamomile, I'd never seen that until uh, seed mixes became popular. This is more views of the same patch for the, the cornflower, the corn chamomile, and the corn marigold, which gives you some clue as to where they grow in cornfields. And lots of plantain, which would be the, the permanent vegetation or part of it later. Corn cockle, another member of the uh, mm. pink family, like the corn spurry. Mm. And this really was a pest. When this set seed, the capsule greatly expands and it's full of matte black chunky seeds which are in fact toxic so uh, that was the one that uh, they wanted to eliminate. Same with Darnell, the, um, the ryegrass relative that was contaminated flower. But we still have plenty of plants 
that can get around quite happily without being introduced to seed mixers. Uh, here's two of them, uh, which are both pretty common. Two spurges, we've got petty spurge on the left hand side and sun spurge on the right side. And sometimes you get a very robust petty spurge and you get tiny widget, but they are as easy as anything to tell apart. This is a, a young petty spurge. A lot of spurges, the, the, the first flowers come very early and they see it set a capsule already before these are hardly developed. And that's a sort of a, a bit of insurance. So there's got some seed, even if the, the plant doesn't come to its full fruition. But this is petty spurge. So it's got these smooth edged leaves, little mucronate point, little tip on all of them. Whereas the sun spurge has these very blunt ended leaves and they're serrated all around the edge. They've still got this same very early flower on the first node, just to get to uh, make sure there's at least one capsule ripens in case it uh, gets destroyed later. But they're very widespread and uh, both of them are common around uh, arable fields in the R part of VC59. This is the viola uh, seed, which was probably in the um, probably the one in the the porridge mix. This is a field pansy, but this is uh, it's got quite spread petals, and I started wondering, I was looking at the pictures, is it? pure field pansy or is it uh, the heart seeds of Iola trickler at some point in this past. You can see it again here, almost the whole of the yellow, the bottom lip is yellow and you know, quite widely spaced petals, but I haven't looked into this properly. But this is the more typical of the field pansies we get, the Viola arvensis, with broad overlapping petals and the, uh, the sepals sticking out beyond the petals. And that's a lovely little thing and, and, and very frequent as this yellow throat and these dark purple rays against the, the sort of creamy white background. And that again is one of the first things I look for when I go out in spring looking at the, the uh, arable weeds because it gets started very early and there's plenty of it about. Uh, uh, I think the, uh, the, the pansy is uh, archaeophyte as well, but this is a native, this is one of the umbellifers, uh, you can see the umbel starting to appear here, and these great long spidery bracteoles. This is uh, fool's parsley, uh, Athusia synapium. And it's very prolific native umbellifer. When it flowers, they're well worth closer inspection. Each little group, like little nosegay with the bracteoles, they go from being horizontal to vertical. And the five petal flowers, a big split, and beautiful pink anthers. Remind hawthorn flowers but uh, obviously much smaller scale and there's lots of them per head. This is a slightly later stage. Flowers are lost of petals, the seeds are developing and the bracteoles are still hanging down. And then eventually the seeds are fully formed and then ripen then split and spread everywhere. Um, I I managed to weed about 90% of them out of our garden in the vegetable growing plots every year. But I always leave some because uh, I just like them. There's plenty in the seed bank anyway, probably, but uh, they're the about the most common of the umbel umbelliferous plants we, we get. Uh, another thing that we way of seeing more exotic species 
is green manures. This is a, a big field just the other side of the Gorse Hill Nature Reserve from where we are. And this is dominated by um, scarlet crimson clover, Trifolium incarnatum, these sort of red hot pokers of deep red flowers and big fleshy leaves. And there's, there are three other um, exotic clovers in amongst them as well. Um, and so far, I've not seen in any of these uh, reappearing either in the same field or, or spreading into adjacent fields. But I, um, I'll keep me out because once they get to this stage, before they've seeded fully, they're ploughed in, of course, and they add to the uh, fertility of this uh, rather acid, fairly sparse <laughs> glacial soil on the side of uh, Gorse Hill. But they're, they're nice while they last. <laughs> if they do start spreading about, they'll of course be neophytes. Another neophyte, that's a terrible picture, go to this one, is from California. Um, again, it's a green manure crop. And like the clovers, it's very, very attractive to our pollinators. Bees love this, this plant. Um, it's Felicia. Facilia, I mean, it's got very tansy-like leaves, and it's in a, a family that we don't even get uh, in, in Europe, uh, the water leaves, the hydrophilaceae, as is pale lilac flowers, and they curl a bit like um, forget-me-nots and comfrey, so they must be uh, related somewhere along the line to them. And I have seen these outside the original planting, so uh, that's another one which to look out for. They might be becoming more widespread. And this is something I see most years in our local fields. Very distinctive leaf. Again, it's in amongst the usual oh. range of the usual. Uh, suspects. This is cannabis, uh, cannabis indica, uh, or the indica variety of cannabis. And you, know, you wonder where this came from. It's sold in bird seed mixers, but there's nobody feeding birds out in the uh, the wilds of the Ormskirk uh, arable landscape. It might it might also be in pheasant feed for the rearing birds for shooting. Um, fishermen use it. I think is is bait, um, but there's no ponds around here, so we wouldn't come of that direction. Uh, they sell hemp seed in the um, what's that health food shop chain? They sell that in Ormsgo, but that's a sort of denatured. It's it, uh, it uh, they won't sprout. I like to think that this southwestern Asian plant is actually a relic from uh, previous uh, crop growing around Ormskirk. Uh, Ormskirk was a centre for rope making and um, two of the plants used for making rope, uh, cannabis and flax, were both grown uh, very, very widespread uh, all around these areas. Uh, hemp, it would be called, rather than cannabis. Um, if you look at the, the first Ordnance Survey map of Ormskirk, 1849 it was published. There's Ordnance Street, the town centre's up there. Our house is down here somewhere. There's a rope walk. There's a rope walk. There's a rope walk. There are rope walks all around the other side of Ormskirk. Well. There's a rope walk here. I'll zoom in on that rope walk. The rope walk has a delightful name and it sort of reminds me that you're probably fed up of me talking a load of old pants now. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd leave it there. If you have been, thank you for listening. Oh, thank you, Peter. Thank you indeed. I hope it wasn't too short <laughs> or too long. No. Well, that's right. I thought I'd end on some, on, 
on some canvas. 